Yes, Mr. Pretorius. Uh, your mic. Apologies, Chair. Mr. Van Tonda, would you look please at page 30 of your bundle T1? I'm there, Chair. What is that document? And just place it in context in relation to evidence you gave this morning, please. That was a sheet we prepared in preparation for the SARS investigation to show where the processing plant equipment of the, uh, the prawn prawns processing plant equipment was um, sent to uh, for, you t for, for, for um, use in the various kitchen facilities of the Basasa operations. But this was just a working document in preparation for our submission to SARS. Right, and you're talking of the SARS investigation into the assessed loss and its application by Basasa. That is what I referred to, Chief. Yes, and I, you say... I I'm sorry, Mr. Pritchard, I thought you said 81, but when I look at 81, it doesn't look like we're on the same page. No, Did we're I get not, the Chair. Page it's wrong? page 30. 30. Page 30. Okay. Of T1. Incidentally, I see that... Uh, uh, 81 does appear to have Mr. Watson's signature. Remember, we have been told that he avoided signing documents. That's not on the page you are referring to. That's much earlier, Mr. Pretorius. Well, but I'll, I'll get there and I'll ask. That's an aside. That's an aside. Okay. All right. You said 3-0. Three zero. Chair. Yeah, I've got it. Okay, you say that was a working document. It was a working document, right? It's a Chair. working document where preparation was being made in order to respond to the queries of the SARS investigators. That is correct. Chair. In relation to the application of the assessed loss of CARC. Yeah, and, spe with spe and also the specific reference to the, to the processing plot. <clears throat> and you told SARS, according to your evidence, that the components of the processing plant were distributed to various companies in Basasa to show that the business continued in one form or another. That's correct, Chief. So, for example, in the middle of page 31, you will see a table. It's not legible, but... Tell the chair, please, what was represented here, or page 30, rather, um, what was represented here under the heading Main Kitchen. That is, we indicated certain of the processing, or specified certain of the processing plant equipment which was transferred to Main Kitchen. Uh, in one of the Basasa catering Premises. That is correct, Chair. So, was the intention to represent to SARS that the equipment had been distributed amongst various premises? That is exactly what was presented to SARS, was, Chair. Was that true? It was not true, Chair. And then if we can go back, please, to page 21 of T1. You talk of various WhatsApp messages between yourself and Jared Watson at the time of your departure and the departure of Angelo Greasy from, from Basasa. That's correct, Chair. Did Jared Watson approach you on more than one occasion <coughs> to meet with him? Yes, Chair, he did. Was a meeting eventually held? There was a meeting held, yes, Chair. And what was the aim of yourself and Mr. Gritzi? The aim was for to get 
Gavin Watson to sign the agreement. How would you do that? By pers uh, persuading Jared Watson um, uh, to persuade his uncle to, 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 to sign it. We basically, I took along some working notes which Angelo Gritzi um, prepared and I took it along uh, for discussion. And that is what we've used. What would you have achieved in, if you had persuaded Gavin Watson actually to sign the document? We could have shown that Gannon Watson has got unlimited funds that he always uses to buy himself out of difficult situations. And by him, if we had an agreement that Gavin Watson signed, we could have shown that he tried to buy himself out of this situation as well. No further agreement was in fact reached. I understand from your evidence and that of Mr. Gritzi. That is correct, Chief. Mr. Fantonda, subject to the need to put various versions of those parties that successfully apply to cross-examine you to you and to obtain your response thereto and subject to you commenting positively or otherwise on the matters relating to you contained in the transcript of Mr. Gritzi's evidence. I understand that otherwise you're prepared to work with the investigators in their ongoing investigation. I will give my full support to the investigators, Chair. And that would include the surrender of any electronic equipment or electronic devices where data is recorded. That is, that is, that is true. Chair, so that for the moment then is the evidence. Uh, Mr. Van Tonder, uh, did you leave during the same, did you leave Bosasa during the same month as Mr. Agrizi? No, Chair, I yeah. did not. You, you left in, I thought you said you left in November 2017. Uh, yes, that's correct, Chair. Uh, didn't he leave the uh, same month? Or he left in December? Of the same year? No. Um, Mr. Gritzi um, left the year prior to that. Oh, oh, okay. But I got the impression when he was giving evidence that uh, the two of you appeared to have been uh, quite close and maybe to be still quite close. Is that right? That is correct, Chair. Yes. Had, had that been the case for many years before you left, um, you both left uh, Busasa? Uh, I would say about 12 years, Chair. Oh, okay, okay. No, thank you very much. Anything? No further questions for the moment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Van Donder, for now, uh, I will release you. As uh, Mr. Pretorius indicated, um, you may be required to come back. There may be implicated pastors who might apply for leave to cross-examine you, and uh, there might well be other evidence that uh, you, it might be decided you should come and give. Uh, so. But uh, for now, uh, I will release you. I just want to say thank you very much for coming forward to give evidence to this commission. Um, you did indicate in your evidence that you are fearful, but uh, I just want to thank you for coming forward to help the commission. Thank you very much. You are excused for now. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, the next witness is ready to give evidence. He will be led by Ms. Butlesi. I've been asked, however, 
to ask for an indulgence in order to collate certain matters in the file. Uh, there's a new aspect of evidence that I think has to be checked and dealt with. May we take 10 minutes? Okay, we'll take, uh, we'll adjourn for 10 minutes. We'll be back at 25 to 3. Thank you, Chair. We are Jen.
Yes, Ms. Buchelezi. Thank you, Chair. Chair, um, for housekeeping, the, I, would ref, I would like the Chair to, look, to, refer, to refer the Chair to Exhibit T2. It, it is in the same file underneath the number two. The affidavit. Yes, the affidavit of Mr. Franz Henrik Stein Forster. together with its answers. I've got uh, Mr. Foster's statement. Is that the one? Yes. Yeah. So may I report that the witness be sworn in? State your full names for the record. Franz Hendrik Stein Forster. Do you have any objection with taking the prescribed oath? No. Do you consider the oath to be binding on your conscience? Yes. Do you swear that the evidence you will give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, please raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God. I see, Ms. Butelezi, that uh, whereas Mr. Agrizi's statement was an affidavit, this one... It's a statement. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. It says statement, and it doesn't start with the usual... I, de I, I declare under oath or I swear but uh, the commissioner of oaths at the end in his or her certificate says that uh, Mr. Foster, Mr. Foster did swear before him or her, but uh, I understand. it doesn't, Mr. Foster doesn't say in the statement that he took an oath. It might not matter for present purposes. I just noted the difference. Thank you, Chair. Chair I, I would like to confirm that Mr. Foster is legally represented by Advocate Witt, who is present in court. Yeah, no, it might not be necessary. He, he, I assume you will, he will confirm that what's in the statement is true and correct, and he will confirm under oath because he's under oath now. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Foster, the document that is before you from from page one up to page eight. Do you confirm that that is the statement that you made for the commission? Yes, I do, Chair. And the signature that appears on page seven of this document, is that your signature? That's correct, Chair. Do you confirm the correctness and that you have the knowledge of what is contained in this document? Yes, I do, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Foster, before we start with your evidence, were you warned that the evidence that you are about to give may incriminate you, and were you also made aware of the le le legal implications thereof? Yes, Mr. Chair. And are you giving your evidence freely and voluntarily? You've not been coerced or be promised anything by anyone? I'm giving it freely. Thank you. And you have not been promised any reward for giving the evidence? No, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, would you please give us your work history as, as, as stated in your statement? Okay. <clears throat> Chair, I started off uh, as a member of the South African Police Services in 1987 up to 1996, in, in September 96. In 1996, I joined uh, Dambu Operations as from the 1st um, of October, and I was there till the end of October 2017. 
Yes, and um, what is the current, current name of the, the Yambu operations? <clears throat> when I started off, um, Meritem was just uh, b uh, bought over and uh, the name was changed to Diambu Operations. And around 2000, 2001, uh, the name changed to Busasa Operations. And just before I left, on the 1st of September 2017, the name changed to African Global Operations. Yes, in paragraph eight of your statement, you give us information with, regarding the relationship that your late father, Mr. Paulos Foster, had with Mr. Patrick Gillingham. Could you please explain that to the chair? Chair, my father was also an employee of uh, Meritum, and at those days he dealt with Patrick Gillingham who was at uh, Correctional Services as they were tendering for the Lindella facility and we had a trial awaiting facility for juveniles. And that is how we met up with Patrick Gillingham as the youngsters and the immigrants were held at uh, various prisons and they caused them to be overcrowded and they had to be removed from there and that is how they met or how he met Patrick Gillingham. And your father, was he working for Busasa? My father was also working for Busasa when Meritim changed to Dahambu. He was working for Dahambu and he was working for Busasa just before he passed away in uh, October 2001. Yes, and at, at the time of his passing, what was your role in Busasa? I was at that stage uh, running the Central Division. I was heading up the Central Division, and so that meant that a few mine hostels fell under me that I had to oversee, as well as the Lindella facility as well as the uh, juvenile facility. And can you tell us about what happened with regards to Lindella around 2001? In or about 2001, Lindella operations grew very quickly and I had to spend more time at the facility. Um, we introduced uh, or we purchased vehicles um, that uh, we purposely built to transport the illegal immigrants from the various police stations um, to the facility where we handed them over to the Department of Home Affairs uh, that uh, again would hand them back to us to accommodate them on their behalf. Yes. Um, would you please tell us about the meeting that you had with Gavin Watson in 2003? In 2003, Gavin came to my office at the Lindella facility, chair, where he said he would like to speak to me alone, and we went up to my office, and uh, he said to me that I need to get hold of Patrick again, as he would love to tender for the catering contracts for correctional services. And were correctional services catering outsourced at that stage? At that stage, it was not outsourced. Yes, and then what, what happened? Did you talk to Patrick Gillingham? I approached Patrick and then carried on the relationship on Gavin's request and instruction that Patrick had with my late father. I explained to him that Busasa would like to do and get involved in the catering sector in correctional services. I then from there met with Patrick um, regularly and uh, 
Yes, at this stage, uh, do you want me to continue, Chair? Yes. At this stage, uh, I was called to head office by Gavin Watson, who went to the vault where he would hand cash to me. Those days, it was not in the security bags as it was mentioned previously. Those days, it was handed to you. I had to put, put it in my pocket and then I would go to my office from where I would stack the money into an A4 envelope so that it would look like it's documents. And then, what would we do with this cash that would be handed to you? Then I would um, meet with Patrick at a certain restaurant, usually in uh, the Pretoria Centurion area. Chair, and then uh, we would discuss um, all the specs regarding uh, the kitchens of correctional services and the menus and I would then hand over the, the envelope to Patrick and he would give me information in return that uh, I then would take back to the office and hand it over to Danny Manson. And how often did you have these meetings with Patrick Gillingham? In the beginning, it was bi-weekly, certain times we met every week. It depended on how much information was needed and uh, that um, would let me in having more or less meetings with uh, Mr. Gillingham. And would you around, around which year was this now? Chair, this was uh, in... Um, 2003. 2003. That's correct, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And would you carry cash for each meeting that you had with... with, with no, Patrick? it was not cash for every meeting that we held. It was only when Gavin called me to, to, to head office that he gave me cash that uh, cash would go with, with me. I don't know if he had uh, an agreement with Patrick or but uh, I didn't question it at, at that stage as we didn't question the man. If he said, uh, just take this worth and give it to Patrick, uh, that is what I did. And do you still remember what, how much would you carry per visit or meeting? It, it, it varied from, from 10,000, some, sometimes it was 5,000. The, the most was around 20,000 rand in cash. Do you, do you remember whether during those days uh, there would be some cash that you would hand over to Mr. Gillingham every month or you can't say whether it was every month? Jay, it was not every month. It was only when Gavin called me to the office and said, here's some stuff that you must take with for Patrick. That, yes. is, that is when... Uh, I uh, then would, would go with Gavin to the vault, we'll take the money out, I'll put it in my pocket, yes. and I will go to my office, put it in the envelope, and take it with. Okay. And these meetings that you had with Patrick Gillingham, did they bear any fruits? Did you get anything yeah. out of it? Yeah, well, um, that led to us getting uh, the, the catering contract that was awarded to us in uh, 2004. Do you remember the value of that contract? No, unfortunately, I, I was too busy at, at Lindella to concentrate on the value of, 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 of the tender. Do you, do, did you know what position Mr. Killingham held at Correctional Services at that time? At that stage, he was a provincial commissioner um, of, I think, that's just when he came back from KZN. Um, he was um, Pumulanga, Lampuapu, and I think um, Gauteng, uh, he was a provincial commissioner for, for all three provinces at, at that stage. I mean, he, there was one provincial commissioner for three provinces, you mean? At that stage, there was one. Oh. He, when, 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 after 94, he was the... Uh, provincial Commissioner from, for Gauteng, from
from there he went, he was uh, uh, transferred to the KZN province. From the KZN province they brought him back um, and mainly was looking after uh, Limpopo and Mpumulanga and then they added Gauteng again, if I can remember correctly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And um, in paragraph 12, you, you speak of an announcement that was made by C CFO for, D for, D for DCS. When was this announcement made? This was in uh, 2004. At that stage, Mr. Gillingham was not the CFO of uh, Correctional Services, although the project was given to him um, to run with, and he was the project leader of, 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 the, of the tender. And this C... I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Butchlesi. Thank you. It look, looks like you might have uh, skipped 11, which appears important, important. Or did I not hear him deal with that? I'll go back to it. Thank you. Yeah, Jim. paragraph 11. Um, Mr. Foster, the information, what did you do with the information that you would receive from Mr. Gillingham? As I mentioned, Chair, it was given to Danny Mansell, and you worked on a presentation and a strategy and to assist and give the specs through on, 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 the, on the tender or for the tender committee and the contract. At the end of 2003, the team met with uh, Correctional Service top management and made a presentation to the attending uh, Correctional Service officials before it was known that DCS would be outsourcing the, the catering services. Who made the presentation to whom? Uh, Mr. Danny Mansell. Yes. Made a presentation to the senior members of Correctional Services. Senior ma management uh, members of Correctional that's, Services. That's correct, Chair. Yeah. Uh, okay, all right. Were you present in that presentation by any chance? Uh, no, I wasn't. I was not present. I, I would have been, but something happened and I couldn't attend. Okay, all right. And you don't know who was, who, who attended this for the, the Department of Correctional Services? Unfortunately, I don't know. But uh, it would have been the, the, the senior management that would have been some of the provincial commissioners and, and senior management of correctional services. Mr. Danny Mansell, what position did he hold at that time? At that time, Mr. Mansell was a consultant for Busasa operations. Yes, and then you deal with what happened in early 2004 in the same paragraph? Yes, and I mentioned already that early in 2004, Patrick Gillingham did the presentation regarding the outsourcing of the catering services that was prepared for him by the Busasa team. Who was he making the presentation to? He was making the presentation with Danny Mansell to senior management of correctional services. And you say that presentation had been prepared by the Busasa team? That's correct, Chair. Was, uh, through that presentation, was it intended to persuade uh, management of correctional services that outsourcing the catering uh, the functions was the right thing to do. That's correct, Chair. According to them, it was needed to outsource. It would save correctional services a lot of money. Okay. Thank you, Chair. And um, the CFO that is mentioned in paragraph 12, as Mr. Chiva said, did you at any stage had meeting with this person? I never met with Mr. Chivasi. Thank you. And um, you deal with the relationship that Mr. Gavin Watson had with Mr. Lindam T. Can you elaborate on that? Gavin Watson had a, a good and close relationship with Mr. Mati, the Commissioner of Correctional Services. And that led to Mr. Gillingham 
be appointed in procurement for the tenders and from there he was a, uh, appointed CFO and he was basically used as the driver of the process because Mr. Mati couldn't drive the process. He had to approve. So the driver that was needed was Patrick Gillingham and he drove the process so that Mr. Mati could approve the process. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, in, in paragraph 14, you deal with what happened after Busasa was, uh, was awarded the, what you refer to as kitchen tender. When was this kitchen tender awarded to Busasa? As mentioned, Chair, it was uh, awarded to Busasa in 2004. Yes. After it was awarded, Gavin came to me, instructed me to meet up with Patrick Gillingham and assist him to procure a vehicle. Um, the vehicle that Patrick was looking for, excuse me, was a Mercedes E270. At that stage, he was driving a gold Mercedes E240 that um, he sold to the company, we as Busasa bought the vehicle from him at that stage the, the, the vehicle, his vehicle or the trade-in vehicle was the value was about 80-90 thousand rand and we paid him 155 thousand rand for the vehicle. So that money was paid in by Busasa into Patrick Gillingham's uh, bank account. Yeah. Uh, what was 89,000 rand? The value of the old Merc that he was driving. Yes. He added E240. Yes. Mileage was very high. The value of the vehicle, I can remember the left uh, front light was broken and out of order and uh, the mileage was very high and uh, the offer that he had on the vehicle was, um, if I can remember correctly, between 80 and 90 thousand rand. That is the value of his car. Of his car that, that he, he sold to Bosasa. That he sold to Bosasa. And you bought it for that amount or for another amount? No, we bought it then at the amount of 155 thousand rand. So at yeah. the much higher, we paid much more for the vehicle than what it was worth. Yes. And that money was paid directly into his bank account. Yes. I did the deal chair. Yes. So I negotiated everything, but he yes. did the financing part. He did himself on, yes. that, on that specific vehicle. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And in, in 2005, you also assisted in getting another car for Mr. Um, Gillingham. Would you please give us... In 2005, Gavin phoned me and said, uh, Franz, you better get hold of Patrick. He needs a car for his wife. And I got hold of Patrick and I said, yes, Patrick, how, how can I assist? And he said, no, he would love to buy a VW Golf um, for his wife. Um, I then went to VW The Glen, again negotiated the deal. Then after everything was negotiated, he phoned back and said, but he wants a few extras on the vehicle. Now the vehicle was already ordered. Yeah. Uh, I was not involved in the finance um, of that vehicle, but Dr. Smith deposited the money into Patrick's account and he settled the vehicle. So I had to issue a Busasa order for the extras on the vehicle and Busasa also paid for the extras on the vehicle. Yes, and do you know how much was involved in that deal? It, it's 14 years back. Unfortunately, I can't tell you now <laughs> how much it was. Yes. And so if I may ask, what was your role at Busasa at that stage in 2005? 
2005, I was still heading up the, the Central Division. So that meant, and Lindella at that stage got so busy that it took up a lot of my time. But then you'll be called to, 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 to secure or to assist Mr. Gillingham in, in, in acquiring these vehicles. Mr. Gillingham had that relationship with my father, father and he knew exactly that when it came to vehicles, he only dealt with all my father at that stage. He passed away, so he only dealt with me because he knew that I could negotiate the best deal at that stage. Yes, and in paragraph 16, you, you talk about another vehicle that you, you assisted to secure for Mr. Killingham. During April 2006, Gavin phoned me and said, Franz, uh, Patrick's son needs a vehicle. I went to VW Krugersdorp, that the local dealership, I negotiated the whole deal and Mr. Mansell, through his company, paid for that specific vehicle. Patrick couldn't take delivery of the vehicle, so I had to take delivery of the vehicle, drove it through to Pretoria, and I handed it to him in Pretoria. And so, <coughs> so this one was for his son. This one was for his son. So now, in the household of the Gillinghams, the father was driving a car bought by Busasa. His wife was driving a car bought by Busasa. The son was now also going to drive a car bought by Busasa. Let me just assist you, the, the second son. Second son. Yeah, the oldest son never received the vehicle. Yes. The, the, the mid, middle child, so the second son, he received also a vehicle. Yeah, but the father, the mother, the mother and one of the sons. Yeah, and then in, in one vehicle, well, we'll get to a, a second Mercedes that I had to buy for him. Yes. But the daughter, I wasn't available, I was on leave, and, and Andres van Toner had to deal with that one. Yeah, so. okay, all right. Thank you. And on paragraph 17, I guess it was time for upgrade. Tell us about the car that we bought for Mr. Killing. In, 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 it, it, Jay, you, you're quite right if you say it was time for upgrade. The E270 gave a bit of problems before it reached 100,000 kilometers. And Gavin phoned me and said, Franz, um, Patrick's got problems with the car. We need to, to replace uh, the vehicle. This was now in February 2007 when you got the instruction. That's correct, sir, from mm. Mr. Watson. He found me chair and he said, Patrick needs a new vehicle. Yes. Yes. And what vehicle was this? This was a Mercedes E320. Yes. And how did you go about in securing this well, vehicle? Well, at, at, at that stage, it <coughs> was just... And I refer to it in my, in, in my statement because it's the truth. At that stage, it was the situation where Mr. Tony Yengeni had a problem with the Mercedes. His Mercedes and Mercedes changed the procedure of which I was, I didn't know about. So I did not have Mr. Gillingham's new residential address as he moved from Centurion to midstream. So I then had to order the E320 in my name. So, yes. so what happened there was when the, it was close to delivery date, we went together to Mercedes and the, this vehicle was ordered from Constantia Kloof Mercedes. And we said, okay, I'm, not, I'm no longer going to buy the vehicle, um, but Patrick Gillingham will be buying this vehicle. And they said to me, sorry, France, it's not that easy. Procedure's been changed. Mm. If you order a car in your name and you're not taking that car, only a family member or a partner in business 
can take over that vehicle from you. And I was basically then forced to go and buy a, a shelf CC, and that's the one that I referred to in my statement as Oak Ridge Trading 114 CC. There were only two members in that CC. It was myself and Patrick Gillingham. And we used that CC as a way to... To say you were partners. To say we were partners. Here's the proof because I had to take the documents to Mercedes and show them that we are partners yes. so that I could transfer the vehicle over to Patrick Gillingham. The, okay. There's an agreement that appears on page nine of your statement, which is the credit agreement between yourself and Mr. Patrick Gillingham. There's a signature. What page? Page nine of T2. Okay. Yes. It goes up to page 17. Are you with me, Mr. Foster? Before, Jay, before I get to this contract between myself and Mr. Patrick Gillingham. Yes. We had to pay in 180,000 rand on this new E320 Mercedes. That is Busasa. That's Busasa. We, yes. So that, that created a problem. And the money went through a few bank accounts, has been stipulated in the SIU report. Yes. And we then had to pay over the money. I was called in and the plan that we made for this deal was to say, okay, Angelo Agrici at that stage would receive a bonus. I then went to Angelo and said, okay, Angelo, um, I need some money. Can you borrow me some money? And he said, Franz, no problem. Um, I'm getting a bonus this month. I will just make sure that they pay over the bonus to you. And then I said, okay, Angelo, in December, I'm getting bonus, and then I will refund you. All right? Yes. So he phoned Carlos Bonifacio, and he instructed Carlos to pay over the money to me. I went to Carlos, and I said to Carlos, don't pay the money to me. Pay the money directly into Patrick Gillingham's bank account. I then got a, a disciplinary hearing that they held on me, a pretended one. Is it the... It's also in my... Um, it's on page 18. There is a... But a, maybe before you get to the disciplinary hearing, let's just get the journey that this money... Uh, followed correctly. <laughs> now, this was the money we're talking about is the money that was ultimately going to pay for the Mercedes, new Mercedes for Mr. Gillingham. Is that right? That's correct, sir. Remember, we had the E270. Yes. We sold the E270. Yes. Then the shortfall was 180,000 Rand. Yes. Busasa had to pay. The 180,000 rand. Yes. That went. Yeah, where did it start and uh, where? It started from Busasa. Yes. Paid to Mr. Agrici. As, 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 a bon as a bonus. As a bonus. From yeah. there, it went to one. It went to, I think, if I can remember correctly, it went through to Carlos Bonifacio's account. Yes. Then to the lady working for. Carlos into her account, yeah. then back to Busasa, yeah. and then from Busasa it went through to, to Mr. Gillingham's account. And you didn't want it to come to your account? 
at that stage we needed the money urgently, so it was just delayed. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Gillingham wanted his new car, so uh, and he couldn't take delivery if we don't settle the the outstanding amount. And what was the purpose of uh, this zigzag trip uh, on the for this money? To confuse any person that would investigate. Mm. Okay. Okay. The case. So, <coughs> so, but it reached Mr. Killingham's account without going through your account. No. Okay. Yes. You may continue. Yes. I, I, let's first start with what is on page 18, the notice to attend an inquiry. There was a disciplinary hearing that was held against you. Yeah. How did it come about? <laughs> like I said, um, I had to pretend that I misled the company with the relationship that I had with Gillingham. And uh, just, just hang on, Ms. Mr. Foster. Ms. Butel is the... It's on page 18. This bundle is confusing now. I thought that it had, it had the same pagination from beginning to end. Oh, un unfortunately, it, it doesn't. There, but there are file dividers in between. We're now focusing on the affidavit or the statement that is behind number two. So how do you refer to, to the parts that are on this side? It's, 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 it's exhibit To T2. make sure there's no confusion in, on the transcript. Uh, it's, it's exhibit T2, page 17. Hmm? So it's page 18 of T2. So you have exhibit T, That's and T. then you have Number T1. One. Yes. That is. And then you have T2. Yes. We're now focusing on T3. T. Yes. We haven't reached T3. It's another one. T4. Yes. And then you start the pagination afresh each time. Yes. OK. All right. We're now focusing on T2, and I'm on page 18 of T2. Yes. Yes. There is a notice that is directed to Mr. Foster to attend an inquiry from Posasa. And my question was, how did this uh, inquiry come about? Chair, also to mislead any person that would investigate if need be. I was given a notice to intent an inquiry. Yes. And a lot of charges were added to that. Yes. That, that disciplinary hearing never took place. It was just uh, being put there if, if we need to use it, if the company would be investigated. They could say Franz Forster was a culprit and we dealt with him accordingly. Now, so you say, although we have here a document written a notice to attend an inquiry and we have a document after that that is now page 19 of T2. T uh, we have a one that says final written warning and uh, that says the warning was given uh, to you in respect of a number of alleged offenses written there. All this was just uh, fabrication. There was really no hearing, and it was meant to protect the company in case there was an investigation and they came across 
the fact that uh, some money had been used to buy a car for Mr. Gillingham. That's correct, Chair. It was it was a smoke screen. Yes. It never took place. Yes. We we only did the paperwork. Yeah. Okay. Because Thank you. Mr. Chair, if you look at, at page 19, yes. for, for the offences there, just to get a, a final written warning, that meant I was very lucky. <laughs> you are right. Yes. And, and Mr. Agrici is listed as a complainant there. Mr. Agrici was a complainant. Mr. Gumedi, that's now the chairman of the company, was supposed to be the, the chairman. Chairperson of the hearing. That's correct. Chair. Yes. Okay. And this, this, this uh, outcome is dated 7 November 2008. That's correct. Now we can go back to... And who said the, all this must be done? Whose well, idea was it well, to say that we must have some paperwork that su suggests that uh, there was a hearing when they knew there was no hearing? Chair, that was a decision that was taken by... Uh, Gavin, Angelo, myself, the group, at that, at that stage. Oh, okay, so you two were part of it. That's correct, Chair. Yes, but it was an arrangement that was made. That was the instruction, basically, yes. that came from Gavin saying, yeah. how are we going to handle this scenario? Okay. The SIU picked up on this money now. Yes. How are we dealing with it? Okay, okay. So Thank when, you. when these hearing or, or inquiry was staged, it was at the time when the SIU was investigating Kusasa. That's correct. Thank you. Chair? Okay, let's go back to page nine. The agreement between yourself and Mr. Gillingham. How did that agreement come about? Okay. Gavin Watson wanted all of us to have written agreements with Patrick Gillingham to protect ourselves, to protect the company, and to protect um, Patrick Gillingham. And we were taken to an attorney, and he backdated and he drew up the agreement that was between myself and Patrick Gillingham. So when was this document produced? It's dated April 2007. When was it produced? This document was produced a day before we signed it, and it was signed on the fourth day of April 2007. Yes. You are saying it was backdated. So do the dates that appear on this, uh, the dates that are appearing on this document are correct dates? If we go back to the statement, you'll see, let me just get there. It's page three of your statement. In February 2007, yes. I was instructed to procure the vehicle. At that stage, the vehicle came to and a half months later. Yes and Patrick took delivery of his vehicle. When they found out, when they first heard about the SIU that would come and raid our offices, yes. uh, they said that we need to get uh, contracts in place between all the role players. So they backdated it then to, to 2007. 2007. So, but was it produced in 2007 or later than 2007? It was produced in 2007, a bit later, but backdated. So it was later in the year, but we backdated it to April 2007. Thank you. So are you able to remember around when in 2007 you, you signed the agreement? Uh, Jay, we signed it. It was much later in 2007. I can't recall. You can't remember the, ma the month. No, I can't recall the date, but we backdated it, yeah. so it was close to the delivery date yeah. of the the vehicle. Yes. Yes. 
And the, the signatures that are on this document, page 16, is that your signature? Page 16 is my signature. And on page 17? That is a signature of Patrick Gillingham. Okay, thank you. So, the idea of this agreement between yourself and Mr. Gillingham, whose idea was it? Who well, came up with the idea that the two of you must conclude a loan agreement? Jay, that was uh, Evan Watson's idea, but uh, I don't know if Andres added his, but they, he also had a, a contract that was drawn up. Then the, the contract between Angela and myself, I was looking for that, I couldn't find it. There was a contract between the two of us for him paying me his bonus and then I would have paid him back my bonus. But that money of my bonus did go through my bank account. Yes. I, I paid taxes on that. Yes. Um, at the end of the financial year, although I had to pay it back um, to Angelo and he paid it back to the company. So, so after Bosasa had paid this amount of 180,000 run to Mr. Gillingham through these transactions that you have told about, which involved Mr. Agrizi, yourself, uh, Mr. Bonifacio, uh, I'm not sure if there's another one. After that, this idea of this agreement came about, or what did it precede the tra actual transaction? Jay did not precede the transaction. It, was, it only, Gavin decided that it needs to be done after we found out that uh, there's a possible um, investigation from SIU side. Okay. But uh, the whole idea, is your evidence that the whole idea of the agreement was simply to try and conceal the true nature of the transactions? That's Namely correct. that Bosasa had uh, paid uh, Mr. Gillingham money to enable him to get uh, the vehicle. That's correct, Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, According to your knowledge, how many vehicles were bought for Mr. Gillingham by Busasa in total? Mr. Gillingham got two himself, yes. two Mercedes. His, his family? His wife got the Golf, his son got the Polo, and the one that uh, Andres van Tonne bought was for the daughter that was also a Polo. So according to me, it was two, three, four vehicles. Is it not five? It should be five. Two, three, four, five vehicles. Sorry, mm. Jay. Okay. Five you. vehicles. Okay. Thank you. And um, on paragraph 18, you also mentioned that the, the house in midstream was built. Oh, for before the house. I'm sorry. Let, let me go back to the issue of the, your, the agreement between yourself and Mr. Gillingham. Uh, you mentioned that uh, other people also were required to have an agreement with Mr. Gillingham. You said Mr. Akrizi yes. and uh, Mr. Van Donder. Oh, is that right? Sorry, Che. Mr. Agrizi with me. Oh, yes. Not with Patrick. Then myself with Patrick Gillingham. For the specific vehicle, the E320, yes. and then Mr. Van Tonder with Mr. Gillingham for the polo for the daughter. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Um, on, on paragraph 18, you talk about the house that was built for Mr. Gillingham. How do you get to know of this? <coughs> Well, it was common knowledge that we had to, <clears throat> or the rumor 
not, not the rumor, those that were close. Patrick told me that uh, we're busy building a house for him. And we also used Rian Hoeksma from Rikele Construction that was well known to me as uh, the person, the builder building the house. So I was aware of the house that was built for Mr. Gillingham. Okay. And other than Mr. Gillingham, did you build, build houses for any of the correctional services officials? Well, I was aware of the house of Mr. Mati at Savannah Hills that uh, Mr. Uxma also built for the company, for Mr. Mati to, to, to stay in, in the house. And who was Mr. Uxma? Rian Uxma. And his relationship with the company? Uh, well, Rian Uxma, like I said, um, he became a service provider to the group through my father. At, at that stage, as my father was heading up procurement, and we did a lot of maintenance, especially in, on the kitchens, on the hostels. We built it um, big high walls around the Lindella facility, around the two north hostel, and around the, the Lepers Flay hostel, where uh, we also later changed Lepers Flay to uh, the prawn farm uh, that would also be discussed later in the SARS query that will also come up in my statement. Yes. And um, in paragraph 20, you state that the full details for these purchases would be in Busasa's accounts. Were these houses paid directly by Busasa? Okay. 20 refers to the vehicles, not the houses, but um, it was, the houses were not paid directly, so if you don't know where to look, you will not, you will not find, but it was indirectly paid through, we saw also paid for the houses, but they had many ways, as I just explained on the one vehicle, yes. they used various companies and, uh, ways and means to, 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 to deal with that. So you will not just go there and just pick it up because the external auditors couldn't pick it up. So, uh, so if you don't know what to look for and the way to look for, you will not be able um, to get uh, the invoices, but it did go through the books. Yes, and the vehicles that you referred to in paragraph 20, you now refer to the vehicle that was also purchased for Mr. M.T. Did you take part in securing that vehicle? Again, in, I was instructed in 2005 to procure a vehicle for Mr. M.T. It was a VW Touareg V8, silver in color. I did the whole deal uh, I negotiated the whole deal. The vehicle was purchased from Lindsay Seiker Kruger's door. And I was not part of the finances, how they handled the finances on that deal. What happened, the SIU started with the investigation a bit later in 2007-8, I think. I got a phone call from the dealership and said, hey, SIU is here, they, they're asking a lot of questions about Mr. Matisse's vehicle and uh, what needs to be done. And I said, well, give them the answers. And uh, they then said, okay, what they're going to do is they're going to, they'll assist them, but they will not hand over the file to them. So the file was... Uh, taken away from the dealership and uh, the file was destroyed by myself. Um, <coughs> Did you take it from the dealership? They found me, I went to the dealership, I collected the file. I didn't even check what was in the file. I placed the orders, everything, so my name and everything appeared in there 
and uh, I destroyed the file. With the cooperation of the dealer? Um, the dealer came and said, yes, Chair, um, well, it wasn't the dealer itself, it was one of the employees at the dealership. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, but uh, whoever you dealt with when you took the file, they knew your intentions. They knew my intention. They knew what it was all about. And that was to destroy the file. To destroy the file. How did you destroy it? I've burnt the file. You burnt it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And when was this? Which year did you destroy this file? This was close to between 2007-2008 when the SIU just started with their investigation. Do you know whether the SIU later on went to the dealer for the file and uh, found that the file was no longer there? They went to the dealership chair and they couldn't find the file. They took a full statement from the dealership and they took a full statement from the salesperson that dealt with me. And do you know what uh, the dealership said happened to the file? No idea, sir. I haven't you seen. You don't know. I haven't seen that statement. Sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And this vehicle was also paid by Busasa, even though you were not involved. I can't say whether it was paid by Busasa. I presume it was paid for by Busasa. Thank you. On, on paragraph 22, you deal with. I'm sorry. Obviously, obviously, there was something wrong that had been done in regard to um, this vehicle. That is why you wanted to destroy the file. That's why you destroyed the file, isn't it? That's correct, Chair. I was asked by Mr. Watson to go and get the file and destroy the file. So I, I wasn't aware exactly how the finances took place. Oh. So I just followed the instruction, like I said. I didn't know. I was not involved in the, the financial part yes. of that specific vehicle. Oh. So I didn't even open to see whether it was paid by Busaza, yes. was it paid cash, how it yes. was paid. I just took the file, the, um, started the file, and I just bent the file. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. In paragraph 2004, so in paragraph 22, you deal with... I guess uh, that, that's when they say files disappear. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> yes, Chair. <laughs> yes, Ms. Butelez. Thank you, thank you, Chair. In paragraph 22, with, you deal with your responsibilities at Lindela. Can you elaborate on what were your responsibilities at Lindela? Okay, then after I handed now everything to Danny Mansell, I had to concentrate on Lindella to make a lot of money so that uh, we could pay uh, Rikele Construction for all the work that was done. Gavin came to me and instructed me to get the figures up. He, he needed more money. He wanted more money. We got paid per person per day, staying over in the facility. So he wanted us... Uh, to get the numbers up. And, and, and how were you going to achieve this? At that stage, we purchased buses and trucks and uh, they were purposely built for us. They look exactly like, like uh, the vehicles from the South African police services that they used to transport prisoners between the, the police cells, prisons, and the courts. Ours were just much bigger. Uh, this is about uh, three, four ton. We used eight and ten ton vehicles with the same more or less body on. We, we then went to the various police stations and assisted them in transporting the people to the Lindella facility. The police had no problem with that as they had the shortage of manpower, they had the shortage of vehicles, and it was always a problem because the, they had one vehicle that need to pick up prisoners from the prisons and take them to court. So it was also always an issue to get the illegals to the facility. So we climbed in there as an as a ex 
policeman station commander. I knew most of the people and we spoke to them and they agreed that we could pick up the people and transport them to Lindella where we would hand them over to Home Affairs and then uh, Home Affairs would do their job and hand them back to us to accommodate them. And which, which region were you dealing with or which police stations? Well, I, I, I also then had a team, two teams of security officers as we were a registered security company as well that worked with the SAPS. They would book us in advance and then we would assist them. Um, they would catch the people. We will then load them onto our vehicles, transport them to the various police stations. There they would do the paperwork. We would then load them back onto our vehicles, transport them to the Lindella facility where we would hand them over. So I had vehicles going around to various police stations and then I had teams with vehicles that were operating with the members of the SAPS. I had one team looking after the West Rand and Joburg yes. and then I had one team looking after uh, the Pretoria area and, and, and the East Rand. How many uh, such vehicles did you have? Chair, at the stage we, we had two buses and six trucks. Uh, Okay. that could pick up people mm -hmm. but you would know today uh, the police will we would in the morning I had a team they would come in they would phone the police and say okay Santon police how many illegal immigrants six you will phone honeydew they'll say four so uh, you would go you pick up six from there you'll go to honeydew pick up the four so it was yeah till we had the bus load full and then we would bring them through yes. to the facility okay and around that time, how many people could you accommodate at Lindella? At the stage, Chair, we had enough beds for 5,000 immigrants. But at the stage, um, Hillbrow had a massive operation where the SAPS uh, immigration, they then phoned us, and immigration also came to us to assist, where they had a massive operation, they arrested a lot of people, and at that stage, we pushed up the figure to about uh, nearly 7,000 immigrants in, in the facility. What we would do is, we would get extra mattresses in, it was bunk beds, so you would have one, sleeping at the bottom, one on top, and, and then between the beds you would lay down uh, a mattress where the other people then would sleep on. So that is how we pushed up the number um, as we got paid per person per day. Yes. And, and do, you, do you remember more or less what, the, uh, the, well, what, what was paid per person at any particular time? Chair, we started off, when we started the company, I can remember it was 28 rand 99 per person per day. Um, when I left there, I'm speaking now on a correction, it was close to 45 rand per person per day. And that's what year now? That I left, uh, I was transferred from Lindella in 2006. Okay, thank you. Yes. And the, the year in which you had about 7,000, was it around 2004, is that correct? Yes. And then usually the numbers will go up around the festive season because um, um, Transnet couldn't provide trains to home affairs to deport the people back because the Mozambicans and the Zimbabweans, they would deport them by train, and then immigration officers and members from the South African police services would man the train. So usually at the end of November, uh, that the last trains will go through, mm -hmm. and then again here, yeah, the last week in January, uh, then uh, the first trains again for the new year. And 
as the police were arresting people, the numbers grew just bigger, bigger, bigger over the festive season as well. So the company was smiling. They didn't complain. Uh, we were work working very hard over the festive seasons because we had to keep these guys calm. Everybody then wanted to go home and you would always have a lot of riots in the facility when uh, Home affairs uh, couldn't assist the people to be deported. Yes. In paragraph 25, you deal about how well Busasa was doing at the time. How did you get to know of the finances? Well, I was heading up the facility. I had a lot of managers reporting to me from that, that facility, and I was also responsible for the invoice that we invoiced Home Affairs to be taken to the head office of Home Affairs. Those days, we were not paid by EFT. Mm -hmm. uh, they still issued checks, and I would hand in the invoice, and I will sit and wait till uh, they give me my check, and uh, that was part of my responsibility. And then uh, I would come back with the check and hand the check to, to Andries van Torner to be paid in to the bank account. Yes, and in paragraph 26, you deal with what happened in 2006. With 20, to 2006 that. was a very good year at the Lindella facility. Yes. We finished the budget for the Lindella facility that was allocated by Home Affairs in six months. In the half year, budget and at that stage Mr. Trevor Manuel was uh, the Minister of Finance and in his half year speech he mentioned that he had to allocate another 120 million to the Lindella facility because at that stage we had so many people in the facility and we used up the, the budget that was allocated to the facility in six months. Yes. And then what happened when Arthur Fraser became the DDG or the DG of Home At the Affairs? end of 2006 round, during the year he became the Director General, Mr. Fraser of Home Affairs. To the end of 2006, he came to the facility and he was, you know, I think he was under pressure for not be able to explain why the budget was used in, in that short period of time. Yes. He came and from there on he had a discussion with uh, our directors and myself and immigration officers, top management of immigration, where he issued an instruction that Busasa or Busasa Security Lindella would not be allowed to transport any people from the South African police services or assist um, if the South African police services had special operations where they went out to, to catch the illegal immigrants. I then had to speak to a few reservists and, you know, they didn't get paid by the South African police services. They were f full members. They had uniform. They would go and book on duty. And then I would use them to drive the vehicles, to man the vehicles, to pick up the p various people from uh, the police stations and still take them through to the Lindella facility. Yes. And in paragraph 28, you deal with your transfer. <coughs> Why were you transferred? Mr. Fraser also came and Home Affairs made it difficult because they found out that we used police reserves and they put a stop to that. And the numbers came down tremendously. The count was nearly half of the count that it used to be. Yes. And Gavin was upset with me for that and uh, he wanted to get rid of me. 
Um, he used me, he abused me, now he wanted to get rid of me. So usually if you were in trouble, they would transfer you to Lindella and you would resign, 99.9% .9 of the Oaks would resign in a month. Now I ran Lindella, it was nothing for me, so they transferred me to the technical division as a junior, I had nothing to do basically there, to belittle me in the hope that I would resign, um, of which I did not do. Um, the oak heading up, technical felt bad, and he at that stage um, gave me uh, the fleet of the group to run, as we also had our own uh, um, workshop where we serviced the vehicles and vehicles then became my responsibility. And which year was it? That was uh, 2007. Yes. Beginning of 2007. Okay. And then and on paragraph 29 you deal with your introduction. Okay, before, sorry Chair, before that. Yes. Um, Angela then in 2008, because you're jumping that, that paragraph, he transferred me mm -hmm. to uh, head office to become the head of procurement, logistics, and I kept vehicles. Um, so I was heading up the whole procurement division for the group okay. as from 2008. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, tell us about what happened during 2008. During the middle of 2008, uh, Gavin came to my office with a gentleman and he introduced that gentleman to me as Kevin Wakeford. Uh, I didn't really know Kevin. He, I saw his vehicle and I saw him a few times at the front offices where the directors were sitting and he said to me that Kevin would phone me regularly uh, to order cement and that I need to assist him and uh, I must give him what he want. And did you know what was the relationship between Kevin Wakeford and your company? At that stage I was not aware exactly what was the relationship between him and Gavin. Um, sometimes you did not question Gavin and ask him uh, why he, he did certain things. He would uh, often tell you, just do what I tell you to do. If I ask you to do this, just do it. Um, you're a white man and there's no job for you on the outside and I'll make sure <laughs> that you don't get uh, a, another job. So just do what I tell you to do. So you would follow instructions, especially if he had a crowd of people with him. Like in this stage, it was Kevin Wakeford, and there were some of the directors with. So you didn't, you didn't question the man, especially not in front of a crowd of people. He would show off, is that what you mean? Say again? He would show off. Definitely, well, he, Kevin is one of those guys in front of a crowd, he, he would take you head on, one on one, you will not take you on. Okay. He needed a crowd. Okay. And then what, what happened during late 2009? Um, We're still on, pay, on paragraph 29. In 2009, Gavin Watson called me and said that Kevin will speak to me and instructed me uh, to buy and deliver wet and dry cement. Now, Jay, if I refer to wet cement, that is cement that you order, that come in these big uh, trucks that's been mixed, it's mixed according to your specification. So it can't be used by somebody else. If you don't use the, the whole truck full of cement, they will dump it somewhere, but that is what is referred to as wet cement. Now, I mm. had to order wet cement from W.G. Wern in Ranfentin. 
Now, if and you dry cement would be cement that you can buy. Normal cement, wherever. the bag of cement that you would buy. Yeah, which is not ordered specifically. That's not ordered spe yeah. specifically. Okay. So we, I had to place orders for, excuse me, if you wanted wet cement, you'll phone me. And Mr. Wakeford. Mr. Wakeford would phone me and say, Franz, I need 20 cubes or 30 cubes um, wet cement, and he would give me exactly uh, the specs, what he needed uh, to be mixed according to, and then he gave me a specific address where the cement need to be delivered. Now, the address that was given to me was at Meyer Park Echo Estate in Meyerton. Now, wet cement, like I mentioned, was ordered from WG Wern, and sometimes I had to order dry cement. A truck full at the stage, that was ordered from Ranfontein Trading Center, called RTC, and of which we had an account with them. I would phone Butch, that was the husband of the owner, and said, Butch, I need um, 10 ton or 15 ton cement to be delivered to Mayer Park Echo Estate, and I would issue the order, give him the order number, and he would make sure that it gets delivered to the specific address. And do you know why you were buying this cement from Mr. Wakeford? I understand at the end of the day that Kevin assisted through another person, of, uh, which he was the owner of the vehicle. This I found out after I did some of my own investigations um, to assist uh, Busasa in a SARS matter. Do you know that person? According to my knowledge, the person was George Papadakis. George Papadakis. That's correct. He's the, he's the owner of the house at Mayer Park Echo Estate. At that stage, we had no street number because it was new, so uh, you only had a stand number. Uh, but if you ask at the gate, they would tell you exactly where to deliver to deliver the stuff. <coughs> was, uh, was Mr. Workford building a house? Uh, what was he needing the cement for, do you know? Looks like Mr. Wakeford was just the middleman between Busasa and George Papadakis. And uh, did uh, Did you buy cement for him over a certain period of time, or was it once or twice that he asked for? Jay, it was over a period of time. It was nearly a year, over a period of year, yes. of a year. Yes. So he would not every week phone me. He would phone me as and when needed. Okay. Uh, and uh, do you have an idea? as to what the monetary value would have been of the total cement that uh, Bosasa paid, bought for Mr. Wakeford? Chair, it was around about 600,000 rands cement at that stage. All in all? All in all, because at the stage yeah. I thought eh, these oaks are building a palace because uh, yeah. of, of, of uh, the number of cement that they needed. What is it that helps you to remember that number? Well, I, I, that, that figure. Uh, I, I can remember, I, I, I sort of, on the sideline, I don't have it with me. Uh, I kept book more or less of the amounts that, that, that was ordered. So yes. I, could, I could see more or less how much it was. Because if mm. I got questioned uh, that by accounts or by Mr. Watson, I could answer him. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And for how long did you stay at the technical division of Busasa? Okay. So we're going back. At technical, I was more or less one year. 
at the technical division before I was transferred to head office and became the head of procurement. Yes. And in 2011, around July, what happened? July 2011, I was called by Angela Grici and said that they have a massive problem at uh, Corano Financial Services where we had the contract with government to be the maintenance plan for subsidized vehicles and the contract was a RT62 contract. They were running at the loss of nearly 2 million rand a month and I had to go and fix it. Yes. So, so I was called in by Angelo and by Gavin, sat down and said, uh, uh, this is the last chance. I must go and fix it. If I can't fix it, um, then uh, they'll have to terminate the contract to try and get out of the contract. Yes, uh, uh, Horano, it's spelled K-G-W-E-R-A-N-O. Thank you. Horano Financial Services. Thank you. And um, what was your role at Ekhorano Financial Services? I was the head of operations. And your duties there? Well, I was responsible for everything at Ekhorano Financial Services. I had to deal with the client, of, although I had uh, members that uh, in every province, uh, uh, relation officers and managers that dealt with the client. So I had to oversee all nine provinces on, on their side. I had the call center reporting to me with two managers um, on uh, everything that we did on the vehicles. And I had to get the contract back in line to start making money. The only thing that we did to get it back in line, I had to retrain two senior managers, yes. and that caused a lot of problems, of which I dealt with. And then in three months' time, I, I, I turned the company around to, to, to break even. When I left in uh, the end of um, October, beginning November 2017, the loan account from that Busasa had with Corano Financial Services was uh, nearly 90 million rand. So I'd, I turned that whole contract around to the extent where uh, I had to show 7.5% of uh, net profit before tax that we paid over to Busasa as well. At that stage, uh, Mr. Leshabani wanted to negotiate uh, a salary increase for the directors and we had to hide um, the financials so it didn't look that good. So, uh, um, and that was also one of the reasons we, we had to do that. But we turned that whole contract around. The only thing that I did, I worked strictly according to the contract. Yes. Uh, I got certain managers in certain positions, and we stick strictly according to the contract. And that is, that's how we turned it around. Just by doing proper work and be disciplined in what we do. Yes, and what happened in October 2013? 2013, okay, that was one of the, the dates that you had to change, so that was October 2017. That is in paragraph 31. Yes. Paragraph 31. So that should be 2017, not 2013. Yeah, 9 October 2017. Okay. 2017, oh, okay. Okay. Remember we discussed no, that the date was wrong there? Yes, is, is it the one above or the one? There are two Octobers. There is on, para, on line three, 
Well, you say I became, became HO, HOD. I, I right? became the HOD in 2011 already, not, not October 2013. That also needs to be changed. That also needs to be changed. So the 2013 in line three should be 2011. Yes. And uh, the other 2013 in the same paragraph should be 2017. Is that right? Sorry, Chair. Uh, I'm saying the first 2013, which is in line three, becomes 2011. That the, is yeah, the second 2013 becomes 2017. No, sorry, Chair, I made a mistake there. That mm. I, I see now that one must, must be uh, 2013. It must be 2013. Which yeah. one? The, the, the second one um, should, should remain 2013. In, yeah, in line one, two, three, four, in line five. Oh, okay. Thank okay. You. Um, All right. Then tell us about what happened in October. Okay, that is, that is where we dealt with the SARS query, um, where SARS queried us moving equipment from CR in PE up to Gauteng. Um, they prepared, Colleen came to me and she had a, a statement prepared for me to say that I used our own vehicles to transport the equipment from PE to Gauteng. I also had to change uh, certain entries in the logbooks of these vehicles yes. to prove that these vehicles were in PE and that they did collect the equipment and they brought the equipment back. And how did you go about in doing that? Okay, if we, I just want to see the attachment. There's an attachment. So if I may refer you to page. 27 of T2. There's an affidavit that you made. There's another one on page 28. Okay, I would read the, the one on page 28 first, because that was the first one. And the second one was on page 27. They drew up the statement and I had to sign it though I was not happy with it it and says I undersigned then my f full names ID number yes. hereby confirm the following the Busasa group has various operational units regionally throughout South Africa and we have internal transportation vehicles for such purposes Regarding to SARS query dated 9 October 2013, we do not have an internal documentation for moving equipment. When we transport from one area to another, we utilize our own transportation vehicles to the maximum regarding space when moving equipment from our premises to any other premises within the group. I signed it. It was commissioned by uh, Colleen Trudy Janse van Rensburg, that was one of our CAs working in the group. After that, I was again on the 18th of March 2014. And is that the document on page 27? That's a document page 27. Yes. It reads affidavit, I the undersigned, again full names, ID number, confirm the following. I refer to my affidavit dated 24 October 2013 and to the statement made in response, letters to the findings dated 7 February 2014, where at paragraph 8.2.14, it is stated that I attest, which I hereby do, to the fact that I am aware of the assets that were transported from PE prone facility to Busasa Operations PTY Limited in some of in some of the empty trucks. So, and I had to sign it 
dated 18th day of March 2014. Unfortunately, I did not have the second uh, part of this document uh, where it was commissioned again by Colleen. Yes, and these two affidavits that you signed, you prepared and signed, were meant to mislead SARS. This was correct? to mislead SARS, where apparently I understand there were 44 million SARS query that uh, the company had to handle, and I understand that Andries van Tonder dealt with the whole inquiry already. Yes, and so uh, Ms. Butler, we are at five past four, oh. but we are left with very little, so we should finish. Thank you. Um, I think we are left with about two or three paragraphs, or maybe four. It's about or six. Or maybe six. six. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. Thank you. But we, I'm sure we can finish, yeah. Yes. Um, you said Colin van Rensburg, who commissioned... Colin. Colleen, it's Colleen. Yes. Colleen, yes. it's a lady. Oh, it's a lady. It's what, a is, lady. What, what was her position? She was, uh, she's a CA in the company, in the accounts department. So she's a chartered accountant. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Ms. Pretorius. Mr. Pretorius, in case you have a commitment that you have to attend to, you are excused. Thank you, Chair. Um, I believe it's been postponed. Okay, all right. Thank Thanks. you. Um, and was Colleen aware that these affidavits that were drawn up and signed by yourself that she commissioned were meant to mislead SARS? No, she was aware. Thank you. They forced me to sign this. I didn't want to sign this. They even commissioned it before it was sent to me to be signed. Thank you. And who was they? Uh, Colleen, she commissioned it as the uh, as um, commissioner of oath. Yes. So who who was it? Who prepared the affidavits? What is contained in the affidavit? Colleen itself? prepared the affidavit. You you mentioned some. You mentioned the figure of forty-four million. Now I didn't hear what you were talking about in relation to SARS and these affidavits. Che, it came to. After discussion, it came to the, it was pointed out that there was a source query of 44 million rand um, that we had to deal with between the prawn farm that we had at CR. So to get that sorted out, we had to prove that we moved a lot of the equipment that was at CR in PE, that we moved that equipment to our Gauteng operations. Okay. So and that was why I had to do the statements and that is why mm. I had to do certain entries into the logbooks of the vehicles. Yes. These three logbooks were then confiscated and they were locked up in one of the vaults of uh, Mr. Watson. Okay. Yes, and then in paragraph 32 you deal with the events that took place in the middle of 2015. Chair, yes, this was not the first time, but we will deal with this one. In, at the end of November, Gavin phoned me and said, Franz? November 2015, eh? That was yes. to November 2015. Yes. Franz, uh, Minister uh, Mokonyane is door to need a vehicle. She wants a cabriolet. Please make sure that you get a cabriolet. Uh, rent the vehicle in your name and deliver the vehicle to her house, to the daughter. Yes. Why he did not ask Angelo to do that? Because at that stage, Angelo was handling the daughter. I wasn't involved with, with that anymore, but it looks like he was upset with with Angelo and he phoned me Yes. to do so. I uh, phoned... Uh, uh, you, when you say Angelo, you mean Mr. Agrizi. Angelo, Mr. Agrizi, yes. Yeah. Yes, dear. So, I, I used... Well, we usually use Brian Travel, Blake's Travel, 
Yes. So I phoned Brian directly, speak to Brian. I said, Brian, I need a cabriolet. It is for the minister's daughter. It's urgent. It's senior. Please get me a cabriolet. He was phoning all over. He came back to I, me. I'm, I'm sorry. You're talking about Brian now. Brian, yeah. From is that Blake's somebody from Blake tra Blake's Travel? No, no Brian, the owner of Blake's Travel? Yes. That's I what spoke I to him directly. Yes, okay. What was his name? Uh, Blake. Oh, Brian. okay. Okay, yes. So they, that's why it's Blake's Travel. Yes. Continue. Yeah. So uh, I spoke to Brian. I said, please get me a cabriolet. He tried all over the country. He came back to me. He said, Franz, I can't get a cabriolet. It's festive season. All the cabriolets are rented already. I can get one, but it is in Cape Town. I said, no, I'm not flying down to Cape Town to drive a vehicle back. So I phoned Gavin and I said, Gavin, I can't get a cabriolet. Can't we get a small luxury vehicle for her to drive with? And he said, France, if you can't get a cabriolet, then get a luxury vehicle. So, Get a what? A luxury vehicle. Vehicle, okay. So we ordered an Audi A3, silver in color. Blake's rented that from Bitvest um, Rentals uh, in Krugersdorp. They situated in Voortrekker Road. And I had to pick up the vehicle and take it through to the minister's house. At that stage, she was a minister of water affairs. Now, knowing previously that she bumped the vehicle, I insisted. I'm sorry, just say that again. Knowing that she previously, when we rented vehicles for her, she bumped the vehicles. Oh, this was not the first time. This was not the first time, Chair, okay. as, I, as I've mentioned. Yes. I said she needs to be added as a second driver on the account. If you were the first driver. I was the first driver? Yes. She was the second driver. Okay. So I forced them to get a copy of her driver's license so that I could send it through to Blake's so that I could add her as a second driver. I was afraid that she would write off the vehicle and then we need to pay for 500,000 rand in because she was not added as a driver. Okay, so I arranged with Richard Leroux to assist me to pick up the vehicle as he was working a lot at the minister's house. And so who is Richard Leroux? Richard Leroux is an employee of uh, Sondolo IT. He was working on special projects. So he was working a lot at the minister's house. Okay. So I, I asked him uh, just to accompany me so that we could uh, collect the vehicle from Bitvest. I signed for the vehicle, everything. He drove the vehicle to the minister's house in Krugersdorp, the in Noordjewel. And we parked the vehicle, handed over the key, and I left the vehicle there. Now, this vehicle, we would have only rented for the month of December. Yes. Um, to the end of December, I was phoned again by the daughter and said she needs to extend the, the rental. So I phoned Gavin Watson. I said, Gavin, um, I'm not going to take this on me. Do we extend this? Yes or no? He said to me, Franz, do ever what she wants. Uh, so it was extended till mid-January. In mid-January, she phoned me again and said we need to extend it to the end of January. That is now 2016. This is now 2016. So I extended the vehicle. Every time, I just had to get the kilometer reading and give it through to Bitways because they had to book it out again on, an, on a new invoice, yes. so they needed the opening and the closing kilometers. So she had to send through the kilometers, she found it through to me, and I gave it through to Bitwest so that we could extend the vehicle every time. So at the, at the 
at the end of January 2016, um, I asked Richard to accompany me to go and fetch the vehicle. I just dropped Richard off at the gate and I... That's Mr. Leroux. That's Mr. Leroux, Richard Leroux chair. And he phoned me and said, Mr. Foster, or he calls me Um France. He says, Um France, please, uh, I'm not taking this vehicle. This vehicle is bumped. I say, how do you mean it's bumped, Richard? He says, Um France, it's bumped at the back. I said, okay, I'm turning around. So I had to turn around. I had to go and see the vehicle for myself. So the vehicle was bumped at the back. It was not serious, but it was bumped. So I said, Richard, let's take the vehicle. Let's take the vehicle back. We took it back to Bidvest. They insisted as the vehicle was rented in my name, I had to complete the paperwork. So I did all the paperwork as if I was driving the vehicle. Yes. So we did all of that and we handed all of that to, to Bidvest. So you had to say how it got bumped. <laughs> Chair, I just said I reversed and I didn't see the pole behind me and I hit the pole. Uh, it was on the bumper, left back. It, like I say, it wasn't that serious, but it was a few thousand rands damage, especially mm. on an Audi. Okay. And who paid for that damage? Uh, well, Busasa had to pay the access. It was added um, to, to the bill. Um, this costed a lot of problems. <laughs> I haven't even mentioned it here in my statement, but mm -hmm. I can mention to you yeah. that, that I got phoned by Angela because by Mr. Agrizi. Mr. Agrizi. Yes. Sorry, Chair. As he had, the agreement was if one of the seniors is doing something, the other senior will, would counter sign and sign it off before it gets paid. Yes. Now, Mr. Watson thought that, okay, France was going to sign it off. Uh, Mr. Agrizi won't know about it and it will go through the normal channels and nothing would happen. So Mr. Agrici phoned me and said, France, I see you rented the vehicle for two months. What, it's, what is it for? And I said, and Mr. Agrici, I say this is for Mr. Mrs. Nomvula's daughter uh, because it was a big amount, a luxury vehicle for, for two months. Yes. And the, the excess on, on the damage of the vehicle came to a big amount. And what was the amount? Can you still remember? I can't remember, Chair. Okay. The amount was, it, it was high. It was close to 100,000 rand. Okay. Uh, for the rental for the two months plus, plus the excess. Mm. Yeah. And Angelo was annoyed. He then had the discussion with Gavin Watson. Gavin Watson was very upset with me. He phoned me and he shouted at me. I was so embarrassed. I had some of my managers sitting in front of me and they could hear the whole conversation. They felt so embarrassed that they stood up and they walked out of my office. Mm. Uh, where he fired me on the telephone for, and his reason was that I'm, I'm trying to bring him, I'm trying to create problems for him. That was his words. You're trying to create problems for me. And I said, but Gavin, what is the issue? If, if I've signed it, you know that Mr. Angelo Agrici must countersign it. So I followed your instruction. Now you want to fire me. Um, but in any case, it's fine. I, I will deal with it. Um, but what did he say you did wrong? Was it that no, you, he, he was unhappy. you told uh, Mr. Agrici or what? He was unhappy because I reported it to Angela. But Mr. Agrici because Mr. Agrici had to sign, I signed everything off, then accounts would take it to him to countersign. If he's not there, Mr. Andres van Tonder will, as the CFO will countersign, as long as there's two seniors' signature on there. Okay. Mine plus or Mr. Agrici or Mr. van Tonder. Okay. In this stage, it was Mr. Agrici that had to sign because I took everything to him. So he confronted uh, Mr. Watson. He was upset. 
and he phoned me and he was upset. Um, Did you say he fired you on the phone? <laughs> it was not the first time, Mr. Che. Yeah. But yeah, I got fired <laughs> telephonically. Yeah. I found and Mr. Agrici, I said, uh, Angelo, what is, what's the story now? He said, Franz, come to my office. So I went to and Mr. Agrici's office and we had the discussion and he said to me, relax, just relax. Huh. I will deal with it. And nothing came of it after, after that. But again, for, uh, for a long time, I, I was threatened if he walked past my office, he would belittle me, especially if he had a crowd of people with him. You know, he would always say, because he doesn't like big people, so he'd say, yeah, there's fat Francie, you know. Uh, he's creating problems for me. Uh, and he, he's going to lose his job. And I said, yes, Gavin, it's fine. Uh, we, will, uh, we will handle it. And that was always my response, but I knew that if he could fire me, he would fire me there and then. Yeah. And sometimes it was more than threats. That, uh, it's like Mr. Agrici mentioned, they were dustbin, and if your name were in that dustbin, they had to work you out. And that was not the first time that they had to work me out. So. Okay, let's go back to the hiring of this vehicle for uh, Minister Nomfula Mokonyane's daughter. Uh, ultimately, Busasa hired this vehicle for two months, December and January. That's for, correct. For her, December 2015 and January 2016. 16. Yeah. From what you have said, it wasn't the first time that Busasa hired a vehicle for Minister Nomfula Mokonyane's daughter, is that right? That's correct, sir. Um, did, it happen, did it happen once before? Did it happen a number of times before? Well, it happened a few times before. Um, where I was involved personally, and then it was given to Mr. Agrici to handle, because it was the minister's daughter and they didn't want me to handle it anymore. So Mr. Agrici would have handled it. And then suddenly, in November 2015, at the end of November, I got found again and say, please, Franz, do the necessary. So I didn't question and say, Gavin, uh, why are you not speaking to Angela, hmm. uh, Mr. Agrici? So, uh, uh, he, and he was adamant that I need to do it. And that's exactly what what I did, I okay. couldn't get the, the cabriolet and I gave him feedback the whole time. Was it always for the same daughter? I don't know how many daughters. The I don't, also don't know how many daughters she's got, but it yeah. was for the same, same person. Or for the same person. Same person, Mr. Chair. Did, did, did you know on what kind of occasions she would require a hired car? Uh, for example, this was in, no, in November, was in December and January. That's um, most of that it would be festive season, but I don't know whether that, that might have been the reason or on other occasions. Do you know what would have happened? Gee, that was the reason for this specific one. Um, the other times when she needed a vehicle, um, apparently she's a student. I don't know if she had whether she had her own vehicle or not. But um, I, on two previous occasions, I had to rent the vehicle, and then it was taken away from me, and Mr. Agrici handled it. Now, on the, you say there were two other previous occasions when Where you were I involved. Handled, yeah. I handled it, yeah. On those two occasions, did you get it hired in your name, uh, the instruction was in always, mm. and even to Mr. Agrici, who will rent the vehicle in your name. Yes. They must not be able to link it to, uh, to the daughter. To the daughter or to of the minister. Uh, to the minister's uh, yeah. uh, details. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, 
do you know what could have been the reason that Gavin did, did not want, or Mr. Agrizi was not happy with this whole transaction? Chair, I can't tell you what was the reason why I was asked, and I can't tell you, you'll have to ask Mr. Agrizi um, what was the reason he and Mr. Watson um, were arguing for me renting the vehicle for the daughter. Okay. I can't, I can't answer that. Uh, how, you, you delivered the motor vehicle to uh, this now in December, December 2015. Did you say you delivered it to Minister Mukonyane's uh, residence? Uh, residential ad yes. address in uh, Nuerdiebo. Now, did you go to that uh, residence only once or you were there a few times? Uh, I only went to that specific house twice. That's when we delivered the vehicle and when, yes. and when we collected the vehicle. Yes. But we, when she was staying in Kenmere Extension 1, I visited the house a few times. So you, you know two houses she Where sold the house. Stage, she yeah. sold the house in Kenmere, mm -hmm. and then she purchased the house in uh, in Nuerdiel. Okay, thank you. And the when you were being updated with regards to the kilometres on the car by Miss uh, Minister Makonyana's daughter, was it done on a voice call or via SMS? Yeah, voice call. She spoke to me and said she needs an extension. And then I would always phone Mr. Watson and say, uh, uh, sir, can we extend it? And he would say, yes, do whatever she asks you to do. And then when I extend it, after the first time, I knew I had to ask for, for the kilometers. Because the first time when I extended it, they asked for the kilometers. She didn't give it to me. I had to phone back and say, just please give me the kilometer reading. So when we extended again in, at the end of December, I already asked for the kilometer readings so that I could give it through to Bitwest. And again, in uh, mid-January, she already knew to give me the kilometer reading. Was it on a cell phone or a landline? Cell phone, cell phone. And from her side, was she calling me from she, a cell phone as well? Yeah, I had to give... Uh, Mr. Watson, I gave, well, he had my number, so he gave her my cell phone number. Okay. And do you know why were you doing all this for Mrs. 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 Minister Makonyane? Or Pusasa was doing this for Mr. Mr. Minister Makonyane? Well, Mrs. Makonyane, <coughs> she had a lot of influence, and I'm, I'm sure she opened a lot of doors for Mr. Watson because we always had to jump when it was for her and make sure that uh, she gets special treatment. She, was, she did not wait for anything. Uh, if we said do that, you would do it immediately and make sure whatever was asked was delivered. Yes, in fact, you deal with this on, pay, on paragraph 35 of your statement. Yeah, I, I, I often question Gavin, Angelo, and the other directors why I had to drop everything to attend to the minister and the family. And it became apparent over the years that she was the key person and link and had huge political contacts, even to the previous president of South Africa. And I had to do what I was instructed to do. And which pre president are you referring to? Say again? Which president? Previous that pres was uh, to. Um, um, uh, even in Mr. Mbeki's time and Mr. Zuma's time. Because I'd, when she was staying in Kenme, that was early, early, early 2000s. So are you saying that uh, what you were informed was that uh, you had to drop everything uh, when Minister Mukonyane wanted something because she had uh, influence with 
uh, previous presidents, including or previous uh, President Mbegi and President Zuma, is that what you are saying? That's correct. That's what you were told? That's, that's what I was told. And who told you that? Well, Gavin Watson. <laughs> it, it, okay. Mm. Thank you. It was not a secret, sir. Mm. Okay. Amongst us seniors, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go back to paragraph 33, where you deal, deal with what, what transpired in May 2016. In, let me just see that date. I'm not seeing May 2016. Did you say May 2016? Yes, on paragraph 33, Chair. Oh, I'm ahead of you. Sorry. Paragraph 33, Mr. Foster. Yes, sir. In, in 2016, I was approached by Johannes Gumeri with the instruction to fix Mr. Sir <coughs> Nechi Chivis. It's difficult for me to pronounce, maybe. You That's N E T S H I S H I V H E. That's correct. Nechi Shive, I think it is. But my own pronunciation may be wrong. Neche Shive, but I think I'm probably close to it. Thank you, Chair. It yes. was a Isuzu Bucky that he owned that was at Westwall Motors in Nelspruit. Yes. I then said, uh, he said to me that it's on the instruction of Gavin Watson. I said, if that is the case, because it was always said that. Uh, Mr. Watson will sign nothing. Yes. Well, I was lucky. I got a signature mm. because I just refused bluntly and said, uh, or Mr. Gumeri or Mr. Watson will sign the quotation. Yes. It was taken to Mr. Watson, yes. and he's the man that put the signature. Is that the quotation that appears on page 23 of the exhibit? That's correct, Chief. Uh, page 23. You see there, that is Mr. Watson's signature. Oh, so the, that's one of the few times. That's when one he of the signed. few times. Okay. One of the lucky times where we, where we got a, a signature from Mr. Watson. Yes. And who was Miss Nechishive? Sir, according to my understanding, he was sitting on the security cluster of the Mpumulanga province. And he had an influence to assist the company to get the security contract at uh, the hospitals in uh, the Mpumulanga province. And later on, it, that was allocated to Busasa. As I, as the fleet manager as well of the group, I had to purchase a vehicle for them uh, to fulfill the function in, in, in the province. So when you were approached by Mr. Kumere with instruction that you must fix Ms. Nechi Shiva's Isu, Isuzu Paki, Busasa had, did not have any contract in Pumalanga relating to hospitals. Relating hospitals, Jay, nothing. But later on, Busasa uh, did get awarded such a contract or such contracts in Pumalanga. That's correct, Jay. Okay, and, thank you. And do you know when that was done? When they were awarded the contract? I'm not, it, it, was, it was a bit later, um, but I'm not 100% sure now. I can't remember the exact time when uh, the contract were allocated to, to the group. Yes. The quotation that is on page 23 amounts to 16,043 rand, 14 cents. But the amount that you said was paid on, on paragraph 33 is 29,000. Chair, yes, uh, the original quote was for 16,000. Yes. But then uh, the workshop manager 
when I spoke to him to arrange for payment, he said to me that there's other work that needs to be done as well, and if we don't do that, it is not worthwhile to spend the 16000 I spoke to Mr. Johannes Gomeri, informed him, and he said, go ahead. So I said, okay, if you instruct me to go ahead, we will go ahead, and that is exactly what we've done, and that is why the invoice came to the amount of, of 29,239 rand and 79 cents. Is that the uh, sorry, I think I must just correct something. I referred to Ms. Nechishive, but actually MS, which I thought was Ms. are the initials, and it's a Mr. Is that correct, Ms. Mr. Yeah, it's a Mr. It's Mr. MS Nechishive. That's correct, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and that invoice is the invoice that appears on page 26. That's correct, Chair. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to paragraph. 36. We, you talk about the events of 2015 relating to ANC. Paragraph? 36. 36. Okay. Yes. Okay. Chair, I only used the one side of the call center for my team. The other side of the call center was standing empty. And in 2015, we were instructed to prepare for the ANC, for them to run the national call center from our facility. And who instructed you? Um, Gavin Watson, um, yes. Papale Shabane, and Joe, the three of them came and said that we need to prepare and get that part of the call center ready for the ANC to use for the elections, the national elections. Did you, you said Joe, you mean Mr. Joe Gumedi? Mr. Joe Gumedi, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yes. What elections were those? That was national elections. Which year? Can you remember? I think it's... There were national elections in 2014, I, th yes. I, yeah, I think. I think it's, it was 2014. This, this is wrong. It was 2014, and they stayed, they stayed over for a period. They didn't vacate immediately. They, if, but a correction, that, that was in 2014, not 2015. Okay. And what, what, what were they doing at, at your premises? Uh, uh, the, the, the IT department had to set up their computers. We, they also had to open phone lines for them to use. So uh, exactly what they did from the call center, I'm not 100% sure. There were about 20, 25 people that manned the call center. And uh, who paid the expenses? The expenses was carried by Koranu Financial Services. And spell, could you please spell that for the record? K G yes. W E R A N O. Koranu. 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 Was this one of the Busasa companies that you One of the for? companies in the group? Yes. In the Busasa group? In the Busasa group, Chair. Okay. Yes, and then what, what what happened then afterwards? At the same time, uh, a massive mock tent was set up in one of the parking areas in front of our national stores, and that was handled by um, Alistair Yeso. Okay. Uh, Alistair was uh, uh, referred to as the GM, as he used to be a a general manager of, of a hotel. He was a general manager of the, of the office park and the restaurant that we had on the office park was also his responsibility. We also had a lodge there where we had 20 rooms 
and where usually the people that would come for training would sleep over and be trained on, on our premises. So we refer to Alistair uh, always as, as a GM, the general, general manager. And was he working for Pusasa? He was full-time employed by Pusasa Operations. And these marquees that she said were erected in your premises? The marquee, the, the renting of the crockery, cutlery, the food, everything was paid for by Busasa Operations. He had to handle the, the full um, facility around. That was after the elections uh, and the NC1, they had a, a massive function on the premises of um, Busasa Operations. So this was an ANC function? This was an ANC function. And who arranged for this? For? This was arranged with Alistair through uh, Gavin. Um, the person from the ANC that drove the process was uh, Minister Mokanyani. She drove the process. How long, how long was uh, the marquee there? Or the yeah, they set up everything. It, 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 it was there for about two weeks. Okay. It was set up just before the election, so they were 100% sure they're going to win. Mm. So, uh, and after the function, it took about a week to to remove everything from the premises. And do you know <coughs> what uh, it cost Bus Busasa? Yeah, that I know. cannot uh, answer. I've got no idea. Okay. But it was a function for about 400 plus people, so it, it mm. costed a, a lot of money. Okay. And so how, how was Huerano paid? Huerano no, Huerano invoice? didn't pay for that one. Yes. I had to carry the cost yes. of the people in the call center. So uh, their tea, their coffee, their lunch, um, toilet paper, um, cleaning of uh, bathrooms, all of that I had to carry on Huerano's cost. Yes, and this maquis was Paid no, that was, that was that was carried by head office. That's the Pusasa office. Pusasa head office. So I I can't answer that question. I've got no idea. Okay. Thank you, sir. That will be all for Mr. Foster for today. I'm not in a position to close his evidence as well as we haven't received any applications for his cross examination. I have explain to Mr. Foster that he may need to come back in order to finalize his evidence. Okay, all right. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Foster. Um, I will uh, release you, but you probably will need to come back at some stage, and uh, I'm sure there may be some assistance that the investigators might still ask of you. But I take this opportunity to thank you for having come forward to assist the commission with your evidence. Thank you very much. You are released for now. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. <clears throat> we are going to adjourn and resume at 10 o'clock tomorrow. We are Jen. <laughs>